Welcome to this week's episode of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Will, tell us about your shirt. Glad you asked. This is my 49ers shirt. I'm wearing it to promote the start of fo a football season. I, I am, am full support for the 49ers. I know they're going to do good this year. Maybe they'll even make it back to the Super Bowl. Go Niners! Really good, Will. Today, our special guest is Executive Director Brett Andrews of the Positive Resource Center, who will be telling us about his organization and how it uh, contributes to the community. Will, please take it from there. Sure thing. Tell us about Positive Resource Center, your goals and missions. Well, first, I just want to say, Will and Keith, thank you for having me. It's a really nice opportunity. Anytime I can come and share a little bit about the work of Positive Resource Center uh, and how it uh, impacts our community. So uh, Positive Resource Center is a 28-year-old um, uh, disability organization. It started back in 1987, focusing specifically on people uh, who were affected by HIV and AIDS. Uh, at that time, the, the name of it was AIDS Benefits Counselors, and it was uh, located in the Castro, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it came out of very caring volunteers. Uh, a lot of them were attorneys, and a lot of them worked in the Social Security Administration that were a part of the gay community, and they recognized that a lot of the HIV-positive individuals were applying for Social Security benefits and were being denied, and many of them unfortunately dying without receiving their benefits. So a group of caring attorneys came together, mm -hmm. banded together, uh, volunteered, their, and gave their pro bono time to represent these clients um, uh, and uh, help them apply uh, and, and help mm -hmm. them on their appeals process. Uh, that organization then developed into a full-fledged organization and ran by itself uh, with a team of small, small team of attorneys uh, until 1996. Uh, in 1992, down the street, there was another organization that popped up called Positive Resources, mm -hmm. and, and it, it, in many ways, I always say, was an idea whose time hadn't come. Uh, the, the disability, the disease was still ravishing the community. Many people were dying more than living. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, medical advancements hadn't happened yet. Uh, what we call triple combination therapy yes. hadn't been introduced. Um, but the idea of positive resources was if you were well enough, you should be uh, wanting to go back to work and interested in going back to work, and there should be opportunities for you to go back to work. Uh, and just about the mid-90s, those two organizations came together and merged to create Positive Resource mm -hmm. Center. So finally, uh, under one roof at 973 Market, we landed. And in many ways, we thought we would catch you it at two different stages of the condition. If you were too ill to work, we had a team of attorneys to help you get disability benefits. Mm -hmm. As your health stabilized, we were there with a full offering of employment services and vocational counseling and rehabilitation to help you transition back into work so that you had an opportunity to address any of your financial and health care concerns. So that program had been, organization had been going on until about 2003. Like many nonprofits, it ebbed and flowed, you know, fi financially. And uh, we hit a financial crisis in 2001. And uh, the organization really went into a, an existential set of conversations and questions. Should we stay around, try to stay around, or should we just agree that we did the best that we could mm -hmm. and then close our doors? They uh, committed to doubling down, like San Francisco, doubling down and uh, went to the community, and the community responded in great ways and had small, small fundraisers throughout, throughout the, the mm -hmm. bars and people's homes. Uh, and then sought to recruit a new executive director, and lo and behold, they found me, and I found them, and it was a really nice partnership then, and I, I remain, uh, I take that position, I think it's still a nice partnership. So in 2003, I came on mm -hmm. at Positive Resource Center. We were just about a million dollars and had a little bit of a deficit to deal with, um, but we recognized that the services were relevant, and, and in many ways, very much codified and validated by the community's effort to keep it alive. Um, and since 2003 until now, we've developed both programs. Uh, we've expanded those uh, populations to serve the mental health population. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that includes a neurodiverse uh, community. And um, we've even started a new program called the Equal Access to Healthcare Program that helps clients um, apply for Covered California, the many exchanges in response to of the Affordable Care Act. So many things have been going on. We've increased our capacity in so many ways. And um, the, the agency's growth has just about quadrupled over the last uh, 13 years. So Excellent. Um, we, we're very pleased over the work that we've done, the board, uh, and staff has just been pretty remarkable and extraordinary and dedicated to the mission and the community. Uh, and I have a good friend in, in Michael Burnick uh, who's been with us for quite some time and in, in various capacities that he's held, um, namely being um, when he was the director of the um, state EDD, uh, was great in terms of guidance and support and helping us identify resources to support our employment services program. So that's a little bit about the uh, the organization. We can talk more specifics as we go on and uh, as they become relevant to um, our time together. But uh, that's Positive Resource Center. Excellent. Who can come to Positive Resource Center? Yeah, well, good question. Um, uh, if you are a person who has a diagnosis, an HIV diagnosis, a letter of mm -hmm. diagnosis from any of your treating physician, or if you have a mental health disability, and a letter of diagnosis from your treating physician. So that means your primary care provider or your mental health provider. All you need is that letter and you can get services uh, at Positive Resource Center. Tell us about your background. Ooh, that can go back very far. Do we, I don't know if we have enough time. I'm getting ready to celebrate. I'll just say this now, be open and honest. I'm celebrating my, my 51st, 51st birthday, September the 21st. I'm very, very excited to do that. Uh, in many ways, I share that because uh, I think, uh, like many of us, we go through our own life challenges. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for every day that I have. Um, I'm a born and raised Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania kid, very proud. I uh, went to Penn State uh, University, uh, my undergrad, and my grad work was done in DC mm -hmm. at George Washington University. Both degrees are in psychology. Uh, the uh, advanced degree was industrial psychology. Uh, and then I moved to New York and worked with Payne Weber in their HR department for some time in the early, early 90s. Uh, and, and then serendipitously, like many things that happen in our life that are equally as fortuitous, uh, you had to volunteer. The corporate culture was that you had to volunteer while you were working for the organization. And they had a vetted mm -hmm. list of organizations that you could choose from. Uh, and I chose this organization called Kids and You. And Kids and You was exciting because I liked kids, and, and it was also funded by the fashion industry. Uh, Michael Kors, namely, mm -hmm. was the was the uh, the uh, chairman of the board of that organization. And uh, the executive director at that time stepped down from that organization. And uh, Michael and the board came to me as a volunteer and said, "I know what what uh, degrees you have, and I understand your expertise. Would you provide?" some volunteer administration and leadership while mm -hmm. we find uh, a permanent executive director. Well, at 28 years old and just being bold and not knowing anything, right, uh, if I knew what I knew now, I probably would have never put my hat in the ring. But I went to them and I said, I'm very interested. I don't have specific skills other than the ones that you are uh, aware of, but I'd love an opportunity to throw my hat in the ring. And they immediately um, ended the search and said, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I often now, when an exec executive director gets the job, I say congratulations and my condolences because you know, <laughs> it has a little bit of, has a little bit of everything to it. Uh, so I was with Kids and You, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a wonderful organization that introduced culinary arts to the children, uh, at-risk youth, and self-esteem programs to New York's inner city youth. I was with them for five years, uh, and then I. Um, set my sights west and mm -hmm. I decided that I would move to LA to hit sunny pastures and the, the sunny beaches. Uh, I worked with a, an organization there called Los Angeles Team Mentoring, an after school uh, program that was in partnership with LAUSD, the uh, Unified, Unified School District down there. And we had a, a wonderful group mentoring program that was based uh, out of the model of three or four students mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, three or four mentors uh, with 14 to 15 students. And why that was important 
is one-on-one -on -one works, but one-on-one -on -one works 50% of the time. And that's a great model to have, and that's a great percentage to have. But what we also recognized, that if you had multiple students that are able to engage with multiple personalities for mentors, mm -hmm. your percentage would go up. They would either identify with the, s the teacher that was there, the community member mm -hmm. that was there, or the college student. And that was the model, the teacher, uh, a, a community member, or a college student. So our, uh, our rate of a successful partnership was much higher. Uh, so I ran that program and organization for five years. Uh, and then, Keith, you and I were talking a little bit earlier, and you said, you know, what got you into the job that you're mm -hmm. in now? And so that took me all the way to, you see why I mentioned 51. Uh, that took me all the way to 38 years old, and I did my own self-assessment and recognized, okay, you're 38 years old, you're a little long in the tooth to be called <laughs> a youth director. Uh, and I uh, decided to just uh, sit down and really think about what my next steps were going to be what communities I wanted to be associated with. Um, I'm, I'm embedded, I am a gay man, openly gay man, and I wanted to use my resources and my expertise mm -hmm. and my knowledge of fundraising and administration more focused on my community. And I knew there were a couple opportunities here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Had never been, knew it well, but uh, only read about it. And there was an opportunity that came up at Positive Resource Center, and I, uh, through a series of interviews, and. Uh, I was successful and recruited into the job in 2003, and uh, I think the rest is uh, the rest is history. Excellent. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you had an interesting tie-in in your own life and your your, your own personal story. Could you uh, tell our viewers about that? Sure. So I had a, a lovely, um, um, wonderful, supportive, caring, loving mom. Any ways in which we can think of our moms, um, that was my mother. And I also had the mother that thought, I think like most mothers, that their child is a genius. So um, uh, born uh, in September, remember the school, the school usually starts in September. Your school year starts in September. Mm -hmm. So uh, way back in the late 60s, you could go to kindergarten as early as four years old. Well, my, my lovely mother, who thought that I was so smart, felt that I should go in at three, and then I'll turn four in the year. I'll turn four in three weeks. So I was, one, always the young yeah. one, and I was the small one. Uh, uh, included in that, or in addition to that, I was left-handed, uh, and at that time not diagnosed but had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So while I was in school, I was recognizing that I was having challenges, and, and frankly, I was put into another class. Uh, of students, and at that time they were considered remedial. It was a remedial class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept going home to my mother and telling my mother that the kids were unruly, they were bad, and they were throwing things, and the teacher really didn't have control of the class. And I was a bit shy when I was young, and my mother couldn't figure out um, what was going on. So finally she went to s the school and, and sat in and recognized that I was placed in this remedial class because I struggled with reading. Uh, and it was because of my dyslexia. Again, misdiagnosed or not even recognized mm -hmm. as a, a condition. And like any good mother, she, you know, there was a call to arms and she, you know, gathered all of the administrators and the teachers and reminded them how, how brilliant her, her child was. Uh, and ultimately, it did work out that I was able to find my way back into mm -hmm. typical classes uh, along with some guided support. Uh, and training, and uh, my particular dyslexia, I do see words uh, backwards, so I often read uh, from right to left. Mm -hmm. So I had to train, uh, through a series of training, train my brain to read then left to right, which works great in Hebrew, but, but uh, I wasn't in Hebrew school, <laughs> so uh, I was just in <laughs> classic public school. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it was an ongoing challenge, and I learned a lot along the way. So, uh, and I've been able to uh, get over that, tactically get over it, mm -hmm. but also address any kind of shame that I had around it so that I could speak in public and that I could read mm -hmm. in public. Uh, but it was an ongoing process, and it's a lifelong process. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have the support that uh, I had as a young, young child and continue to have that support. And in many ways, it's why I remain in the work and, and uh, it, why it's so gratifying to me today. Excellent. So you just mentioned the challenges that you faced. Um, what challenges are uh, Positive Resource Center facing uh, these days? You'd mentioned earlier that um, 
as many nonprofits faced earlier in the decade, uh, financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully these are less so. Um, yeah. But beyond those, what, what sort of things are uh, PRC having to work on? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, you know, I will. I, I, I can't, as a good executive director, I can't pass on the fact that fun funding will always be a yeah. challenge. So let's let's just you know, it's kind of sort of the fundamental mm -hmm. challenge of any good uh, nonprofit. The existence of them, just advancing their mission in any in any real way. Um, I think some of the main challenges that we have in San Francisco. Are are an outlay or uh, of the booming economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, occupancy is a big deal right now. Um, we've we've been meeting with the mayor and the board of supervisors to talk about uh, displacement, particularly mm -hmm. in the mid market area. Yep. So this creates uh, a, a destabling effect for so many nonprofits who then are um, dislocated. Many moving uh, across to the East Bay. Uh, many having to make the hard choice of uh, reducing their services to cover the cost of increased occupancy. So I am pleased to say that uh, the mayor and the board of supervisors are, are continuing to pay attention to that. There is a, uh, a fund of money that uh, they did find, about $4.2 mm -hmm. that uh, nonprofits can apply for uh, bridge funding uh, to help and some technical assistance that they're also providing to help um, uh, nonprofits really address the particular issue, and then on a larger scale and on a, on a more long-term strategy, uh, as the city continues to build and buy and and are in partnership with many developers, talking about mixed use yes. in the building. So, uh, a, a nonprofit has an opportunity to provide services on the main floor, uh, and then affordable housing on some top floors or just different types of housing and other commercial. Uh, uh, businesses along the way. So it's really about prioritizing uh, non the nonprofit sector. The city uh, significantly relies on nonprofits mm -hmm. to provide much of their health and human services, uh, and they know that. And uh, when as we continue to talk with the city and, and the mayor and the Board of Soups, they do recognize that in the Department of Public Health. So it is a partnership that just can't be in goodwill and symbolically, it has to be also with real dollars because we are providing a real service and it is business uh, at the end of the day. So those are some of the challenges that we're facing at the, at the moment. Tell us more about your services for persons on the spectrum. Well, thank you for asking, Will. This is a, you know, I could spend a great deal of time on this uh, because it wasn't naturally that we had an understanding that many of our clients and were coming and were on the spectrum. Many of them did not know themselves that they were on the spectrum. So as I mentioned earlier, many of our clients come to us who are either HIV positive or have some mental health condition, and there's a diagnosis there. Uh, but as we provided the particular service to the client, and sometimes, particularly in employment, uh, we were recognizing that there were other barriers that they were facing uh, that were keeping them from either making appointments or that uh, they were having a false start in a, in a particular job interview and sometimes even on the job where there was not a full understanding by either themselves or the employer. So embedded in our program is a vocational assessment that we work hand in hand with the treating provider to have a full understanding of what our clients really are facing. So uh, a lot of our clients get diagnosed um, after they have participated in our services, and it is through the activities of our services, which is career counseling, resume writing, uh, cover letters, mock interviews, uh, those type, and uh, of course, um, computer training, that we really recognize and assess and track and monitor uh, one's engagement with our services. And if there are any barriers along the way, we sort of drill down in there to just s dig around and find out if there's something that we can do or if there's something that uh, we can introduce to the client and then do a partnership, almost like case conferencing with the treating provider. Mm -hmm. And we find that there is a uh, uh, certainly a, a percentage of clients who in many ways did not know that they were on the spectrum and solved in the diagnosis of getting it, solved a lot of their problems. They finally knew what was in their way. 
So um, uh, we continue to learn more, and I've always said this, our, our services, in many ways, the professional development of our services come from the fact that our clients come to us in so many different ways. And then we shape our services around it to respond. So um, we're, we're very excited to work with a population that in many ways lots of folks don't understand. I think there are, uh, in the broader community, uh, questions that will forever remain in the uh, employment community and the workforce development community. But the work that we're doing is educating employers to have an understanding that some conditions, some disabilities, some um, diseases uh, are invisible. And you, uh, if you're coming to the work and you're bringing great skills and abilities, that the work should be able to accommodate you in the ways that one should be accommodated. We have, certainly we have federal laws on that. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, our, our employers are living up to the spirit and the letter of those laws, under, certainly under ADA. Excellent. You mentioned something uh, in passing that I think would be of great interest to uh, many members of our community. Uh, quite frequently, uh, people in our community have not been formally diagnosed as children, and then finding upon that they reach adulthood, it's extremely expensive to receive a diagnosis. At the same time, you mentioned that you require a diagnosis uh, to be part of the Positive Resource Center. Mm -hmm. And you also, if I heard you properly saying, a number of the people, your clients, have been diagnosed afterwards. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that for our audience? Well, m the majority of our clients are, are what we call in care. They are yep. in some, they, they do have a treating physician. So, and, and our clients are predominantly low income. Uh, to extremely low income. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are public benefits that they are already engaged with and are already accessing. So in, in terms of the cost, I just want to address the cost component of it. In many ways, they, they all, mm -hmm. their cost is already addressed and taken Understood. care of. Uh, now, in terms of just uh, moving forward in some um, collaborative way of identifying whatever could be the condition that any one of our clients have, that is where we work immediately hand in hand with their service provider. And there are, you know, there are many, many laws and uh, many uh, procedures and practices that you, you must follow and have in place because this is uh, private information. This is mm -hmm. what we call you know, patient information. So we get releases from them with their approval and then have either case conferences face to face or phone case conferences and the client is uh, always there to and the, uh, to facilitate the conversation. So it really is investigative with really the client leading the way. We say this is a client-centered approach. Mm -hmm. uh, if one, if we, and just to have the fullness of it, the majority of our clients certainly move forward as they learn about their condition, but some clients really need some time to digest it, to really understand it, figure out how it's going to fit within their life and we give them the opportunity to do that. So I say it's client-centered, mm -hmm. so that client can make the decision to take six months, uh, a year off, to really have an understanding. Uh, possibly there could be a, uh, an introduction of a particular medicine that they need to adjust to, uh, and that we're always there for them. So it, it very much is a client-centered and culturally appropriate way in which we provide the service. Very good. Anything additional, Will? Have you been have you been have you been involved outside of Positive Resource Center? Uh, in the autism community, uh, mainly well, mainly with your father, I will say that uh, we've been doing some great work together. Uh, there's a local effort. Uh, uh, well, there's a there is a civil service code uh, ordinance rule one fifteen uh, that we that uh, your father uh, Mike and I have been working on and and. Under Rule 115, um, we're expecting that the city is going to respond by uh, opening doorways and pathways and job opportunities for people who do have different types of disabilities. Obviously, those with um, uh, neurodiverse disabilities are very much included in that. Um, and we're also working at the state level, mm -hmm. looking to see if there are opportunities. There are uh, some funding opportunities that we've been able to uh, successfully secure for Positive Resource Center. So again, an, always an ongoing challenge. It's often embedded around uh, requests for proposals and responding to those and funding in order to do the work. Do the work. Yes. Okay. 
what are your goals outside what are your goals outside of positive resource center my personal goals or my profession my professional goals outside of positive resource center your professional goals my professional goals well you know my time is i'm pretty busy um, these days at Positive Resource Center. Um, what I didn't share, what's eating up a, a great deal of my time, and I'm fortunate to uh, be a part of it, I'm on the Ethics Commission. I'm, uh, I'm the Vice Chair of the County Ethics Commission, and uh, that is a, a governing and oversight body that uh, enforces uh, campaign finance law and uh, uh, many other aspects of good government. And uh, we just uh, uh, lost our executive director. He moved back to the East Coast. He was wonderful. He was there for 12 years. So I'm also uh, um, co-chairing the um, executive search committee. So we're looking. So as myself as an executive director, I'm helping to look for an executive director. So that's uh, certainly keeping me busy, and I'm enjoying that work. Uh, if some of our uh, viewers were saying a uh, positive resource center might be able to help them, what would the best way for them to start out or to apply? Yeah. So, so I would uh, certainly go to our website, which mm -hmm. is www.positiveresource.org. That's www.positiveresource.org. Mm -hmm. uh, our phone number is 415 -777 -0333. Uh, and you can call the front desk, and they will. Mm -hmm. uh, each program has its own uh, orientation and intake process, and uh, it's it's good to get an understanding of what those are. But again, uh, the 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 entry point into Positive Resource Center is very low. If you have a, a letter of diagnosis mm -hmm. and either one of those conditions, HIV or uh, in the spectrum of mental health disabilities or any condition, you or have the ability to access our services. And I do want to say we serve about 2,000 clients a mm -hmm. year, so it is, uh, it, the, we put forward significant effort in terms of uh, the services that we provide mm -hmm. to the community. Thank you. I previously heard in discussions with your organization that uh, people who are interested, who think they might be a service, can also do an initial intake through uh, San Francisco Mental Health Clinics or something like that? that Could you elaborate on that? Sure. We are in partnership with uh, uh, 13 different mental health clinics uh, across San Francisco. So any of those uh, treating providers through a referral process can send a referral and we accept those referrals and then mm -hmm. send those clients, they can send those clients over. Often many of those clients are accompanied by a case manager or a social worker that will uh, help them navigate uh, not only uh, physically San Francisco, but then na help them navigate the system. These are complex, you know, employment services uh, for any of us mm -hmm. can be a challenge because we're always trying to figure out who we are and what we want to do and who we want to be when we grow up, right? So that is, uh, that is for all of us to figure out. Uh, through the disability process, applying for disability, it's a complex system. Social Security Administration uh, is, is big and it's bureaucratic and uh, the forms are complex. So there okay. is guidance that is needed, and um, our, we have trained attorneys and legal support staff to really help our, our clients understand what the process is, manage their expectations around it, and then provide full representation and advocacy. Uh, but we do have a referral process, and we have partnership with, as I said, 13 different uh, mental health, uh, county mental health uh, clinics across San Francisco. Well, thank you again, uh, Brett Andrews. I really appreciate the information that you've given us. It's been extremely valuable to our community. One last time, could you give the information of contacting a Positive Resource Center for our audience? I sure can. So if you want to go online, it's www.positiveresource.org. And if you want to give us a call, it's 415-777-0333. And I just want to thank you, Keith and Will. It was really great spending some time with you. I'm, I'm excited about what you have coming up today, and I know you're going to talk about it, Keith. I wish I could join you on that one. So, uh, again, thank you for having me. Thank you. I expect to hear very good things about you. Thank you. Going forward. Well, along those lines, as Brett was mentioning, later on today we're having our annual Ascend picnic, and we may be in future shows giving you some uh, film coverage of that. It's a very successful and enjoyable event that we often have. Also upcoming uh, will be the second uh, 
session of our Rebooted Job Club, which will be sometime next month. We'll have more information for you upcoming on that. But the first session that we had last week was very, very successful. Uh, got a lot of good attendees and some very good publicity from uh, one of the attendees there. So if you're interested in that, uh, contact our website at Ascend, info at ascend.org, and we'll be happy to tell you more about that. So I think that's it for this week. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And I'm Brett Andrews with Positive Resource Center. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Tune in next week. <laughs>